chapel. Who's ready for chapel this morning? Come on, get close. Get close. Today is a family day. Today we have another opportunity to worship the King of Kings and set our attention on Him. Are y'all ready to worship Jesus this morning? It's great. To, that's that's the, the ultimate reason why today is a good day because it's another day to worship Jesus. But today is also a good day because we have the family that has come home. Today is alumni day. Several of our alum are here. It's going to be a fun day. Some of you have already had them in class this morning. They'll be teaching some of your classes this afternoon. And so you'll get to hear some of their wisdom of what it was like for them as students at Highlands College, what it's like for them in the real world in churches and ministries today. So I'm excited about their example. And today in chapel, chapel is also alumni-led. So we had student-led chapel, but today is alumni-led chapel. And from production to the worship team. We have two worship leaders today that are with us. We have Jessica Elson, class of 2015. We also have Kelly Robertson here, class of 2012, which is crazy. And I'm just so thankful that y'all would come and lead us in worship. And I can't wait for y'all to, to hear from them and be ministered to by them. It's gonna be an incredible day of worship. And I'll say, you know, keeping this by faith, theme. No, we have the students sharing, but the theme verse for us comes out of Hebrews chapter 12 that says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that there's these men and women who have gone before us that are now in heaven and are watching us. We have, thank God we have the cloud of witnesses, but we have currently men and women in churches who are leading the way, paving the way, are trailblazers for you. I thank God for the cloud, but I also thank God for you, for our alumni who are going ahead trailblazing on behalf of our Highlands College students. So one more time, why don't y'all give it up for our amazing alumni. And I just wanna thank God for them and then I wanna thank God for this day. So let's pray before we head into worship. And Father, today is all about you. God, we give you the glory. We thank you, God, that we are calling on the same God that called us. We're calling on the same God that called these alumni. You are a good God. Thank you for what you're doing in the church. I pray today that we would be encouraged, but more than that, that you would be glorified. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, come on, Highland College. Why don't you put your hands together? Let's lift our voice in worship because he is worthy. Praise is yours. 
He's worthy of your blessing today. Thank you, Lord. What's up, Highlands College? How we doing? Awesome. My name's Kelly. I am part of the class of 2012. And let me tell you, chapel looks a little bit different now. Um, just know that you're blessed right now. Um, but man, uh, Hamid told me that you guys were in a series of faith right now. Is that right? That's amazing. I hope that we never graduate from that season. Um, and as I was preparing, if any of you guys are communicators in the room, you guys know that sometimes when you're preparing for a moment like this or a sermon, sometimes you start to write it and prepare and you're like, dang, this is for me. Um, like maybe more than the people I'm talking to. Uh, and I kind of found that to be true for uh, this, this moment here. I was just thinking about who was going to be in the room. And, you know, you guys are ministry students. And there's staff in the room as well. And um, you guys are by trade, not even by nature. You're by trade faithful people. Like you guys are faithful. Um, you have to be or you're going to get kicked out or fired. So... <laughs> Um, you guys are faithful people. And by faithful, I just mean you guys work. Y'all grind. Like, this is what y'all are doing. Y'all committed to it. And uh, you guys work. I mean, y'all are at chapel on time, uh, except for the creatives. Y'all probably walked in a couple minutes late. I saw you. Um, but you guys come to chapel. You guys are getting straight A's, I'm sure. And uh, if you're on staff, you're here every day. Y'all are serving on Sundays. And uh, y'all serve at motion night. Y'all serve at one. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all serve at one tonight. What's up? <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> um, and then also, y'all serve at Groshen. This, like, Groshen's, like, 14 weeks long straight. Y'all just eat ground beef with no sides and no sleep. Like, you know, Groshen's crazy. If, if this y'all's first year, then y'all just wait. It's going to be it's gonna be dope. Y'all are all going to be carnivores by the time it's over. Um, but anyway, man, y'all serve. And I'm in the same position. I'm on staff at a church. And uh, I just, you know, as I was preparing, I feel like the Lord was like, Kelly, there's a difference between being faithful and being somebody that's full of faith. And um, by somebody full of faith, I mean, this is what I'm talking about. So, uh, you know, it's somebody that, that like knows the Lord, that has faith in the Lord. And I don't mean, I don't mean that we believe in, like, if you believe in God or not. Um, I've been praying for Pastor Lane's salvation for a while. Um, so hopefully this chapel, he'll make that decision. But um, I'm talking about if you've ever had like a coach or a parent that they believe in you. They don't, it's not that they, like, it's not about you existing on planet earth as a human. They believe in what you're capable of. And people that are full of faith, they know who God is. They know who he's capable of or what he's capable of. They know what he can do. They know, you see what I'm saying? They have, they have that faith in him. And sometimes we can get so caught up in faithfulness that we, we reprioritize our life to where we put faithfulness over being full of faith, okay? We gotta have both. Like without works, faith is dead, right? So they're both important, but just know that faith is way more important than anything else. And um, Michael said it was okay that I didn't have a real Bible. So just letting y'all know. Uh, y'all know this verse probably. So it's Hebrews chapter 11. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not without faithfulness, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's powerful. And if you skip on down, it says, God's greatest desire and pleasure is to be believed by us. Not just to believe that he is he exists and he's our Lord and Savior. That is the, that's the most important thing, but also to believe in who he is, what he's capable of, what he can do. And there may be some people in the room that have found yourself putting faithfulness above that. Maybe your small, your, uh, your quiet time has slipped up. Maybe you've gotten so busy that you're not making time for the Lord and you've subconsciously, um, you know, forgot that God can heal your brother that seems like a lost cause. So I just, you know, maybe there's somebody in the room. I'm not great at landing a plane, um, but I hope that was encouraging to you guys. The good thing is, the good thing is, is um, if you found yourself in that place, that it's very simple 
that you just make the decision. It's a mental shift. And we have two songs. Y'all know how chapel goes. We got two more songs. That's plenty of time for you to change your heart posture, repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry for putting faithfulness above faith. They're both important. But Lord, I just put that back in. I put you back in the top spot. And, um, and yeah, like that can happen right now. So hopefully that was helpful. Let's pray and let's just have a moment with God. Let's realign. God, we love you so much. God, we thank you so much for being a God that loves us, God, and that, that gives us second chances, Lord, and, and is, is so gracious towards us, Lord. So we just realign our priorities, God. We put you back in first place, Lord. You are the most important and amazing thing that we could ever commit to, God. A thousand generations falling down in worship, sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us, and all who will believe, will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. See your name. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all.
Jesus. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Savior of the world. All hail King Jesus. Yes. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus. Come on, give him your affection today. Give him your heart today. Give him your praise today. It's not just another chapel. Oh. your name holds all authority and all power in this place today there's no one more worthy than you king jesus we fix all of our affection all of our adoration on you and you alone in this morning everything we need you have father so we worship you you are worthy father from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt thank you jesus we lift our praise in this place we sing Place today. 
stone was moved for good for the land that come. Oh, that's right. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Oh, come on, we declare it in this place, church, today. And the church of Christ was born. There's no one like you in all the earth. Your name holds all authority and all power. We surrender to you today, Jesus. We say prepare our hearts, prepare our minds. God, fill our thoughts, words, and actions with your fruit today. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you guys can turn and greet somebody? And you can say, are y'all ready for the race? Because I'm not. Come on, Highlands College, how are y'all doing today? Are y'all enjoying this By Faith series? Make some noise if you are. Uh, real quick, can y'all please help me, our alumni-led chapel, can we give it up for them, leading us in the presence of God? Come on. You guys can be seated. I'm so encouraged on days like this to see some... Uh, alumni that I even went to school with, and I know we got an incredible chapel and full day planned today. I know some of the fourth semester spent time in MINL with some alumni. And so what we're going to do here is I'm about to bring them up, and I want you guys to go crazy and make some noise, and we're going to have a conversation about what it looks like to be planted and thriving. Uh, these alumni have been seasoned. I've been in ministry for a little bit. And then after that, we're going to do a little four on five. How do y'all like that? Does that sound good? 
So Highlands College, could y'all make some noise, stand up and honor these alumni as they come up? We got Texas, Tennessee represented. All right, all right. So we're going to get things kicked off. Why don't we start with some introductions? So, uh, Cody, I'll let you go first. If you could uh, introduce yourself and tell everybody what year you graduated, okay? What practicum you did. I know it was a practicum back then. Practicum. And I don't um, know this major stuff. There, yeah, we're majors now. And then um, what you do at your church. Yeah. So, hey, everybody. I am Cody Pierce. I am <laughs> class of 2017. And um, I was in the student practicum where my student, come on. You know who's in students because they're the loudest. So that's, that's the truth. Um, but I am at Heartland Church in Dallas, Texas, uh, led by Pastors Jesse and Kendra Dean. And I um, am our service and events director. Come on, that's awesome. Yep. So I'm Jessica Elston. Class of 2015, long time ago. Um, I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee. I've been there for eight years at Faith Promise Church. Um, Pastor Chris and Michelle Stevens, and actually our uh, senior pastor just transitioned last year to Pastor Zach and Rachel Stevens. It's an honor to be there. I am our central worship pastor there. Um, but there was a journey. We'll probably get into that. But um, I'm currently that since August of last year. So it's been awesome. Yeah. <laughs> worship practice. Track. It was track oh, back in the day. Track. Oh, track. Worship track back in the day. <laughs> the real ones. Yeah. Hi, I'm Abby Lee, and I. Hello. Um, and Tanner will introduce himself in a second, but we're married. Spoiler alert. And uh, we are at Celebration Church. I graduated in 2016. I feel like we're like staggering years. This yeah. is perfect. Um, and I was a part of the student practicum. <laughs> Led by me for one semester, and uh, it was as awkward as it sounded because we were dating at the time. Uh, but that's they not didn't, allowed anymore. Yeah, that's not right? allowed. I, I don't. Know. It shouldn't be, honestly. Um, no, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm Tanner. Uh, I'm class of 2014, so we got 14, 15, 16, and 17. And uh, I was worship track. And uh, yeah, it was amazing. And I've been to Celebration Church for nine years in Austin, Texas. And let's go, Austin. And yeah, love it. Honored to be here. That's awesome. So, hey, oh, and I'm I, the next gen pastor. Next gen pastor. Okay. Yeah, so, so kids, I did the serve. math. So you, we didn't have to do it. Okay. So y'all didn't have to do it. Right here, post Highlands College graduation is 34 years of ministry represented. Okay. Collectively. And so uh, it's really cool to see you guys back here. And you know, we talk a lot about HC family. Y'all are. HC family, um, and it's so cool to have y'all back, and so I'd love to start maybe with you first, Abby, is talking about a skill or lesson you learned while in Highlands College that's been valuable over the course of your ministry so far. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think Highlands College shaped me in so many ways. I, um, I grew up a missionary kid when I was four years old. My family moved to India, and now my parents have been missionaries in Israel for over 13 years. And so I grew up seeing the global church and being a part of just gritty church planting missionary life and moved back to uh, Birmingham when I went to started going to college, went to Jeff State for two years before I found Highlands College and was really just in a season of kind of trying to figure out who I was in so many ways. But when I came to Highlands, I feel like God opened my eyes to what God was doing in the church in America. It was like the first time that I feel like my heart connected to that. And um, I learned so much through that. But I think that, uh, you know, when Hamid sent me this question, I was thinking about a few things. The first thing is that um, I wanted to shout her out. I know she's not here, but Jill Pettis really shaped my life when I was here. And she still does. I have a, we have a two and a half year old boy and I'm always calling her for parenting advice. But um, I just, I think back to my Highlands College time and think about the relationships that we built and they have carried us through so many different seasons. Jill um, and, you know, Pastor Mark would let me come and babysit their four boys, which was like, I can't believe they would trust me to do that. Um, but 
I mean, I even today in parenting moments, I think back to those times and I think about how God shaped me in those moments. And so, so much happened in the classroom and in chapels and all that. But I think through relationships, God really built um, in me who God needed me to be in the future. And so I would just say, whatever relationships you have, dive deep into those. Be watching how, not just how people conduct themselves in ministry, but how their marriage is, how their family is. God will build something in you for the future. Um, and so I think that's super important. But the second thing is that I think that God opened my eyes to just what God could do through this generation. And there are so many things that when we moved to Austin that God started birthing in our hearts dreams And because we had been at Highlands, it's like we didn't know exactly what it was going to look like for us, but we had a picture of what it could be. And I think, you know, in Austin, we're dealing with a lot of first-generation Christians and a lot of students that have never seen anything like what we're getting to be a part of now. And I'm just so grateful for this season that God really birthed in us just um, the faith, honestly, to when God said, do this, we could say yes. And we had some strategies around that and kind of had um, some strength built in us because of this season. That's so awesome. I love that. And uh, incredible ministry at Celebration in Austin. And uh, going to another place in Texas with Cody, uh, I know that we were in school together and um, we're, we're close and friends. And, you know, on the idea of being planted in ministry, uh, talk a little bit about what that means for you, thinking through students that are deciding, coming up on graduating, where they want to go, where they want to plant, and your story through Heartland. Absolutely. So, um, you know, when I was looking for a church, I was lucky enough to have relationship um, with some of the team and the pastors at Heartland before even coming to Highlands College. They were actually the ones that told me to come to Highlands College. Uh, but when I came, I didn't know a door would open back up. Um, but for me, I just decided, I started Highlands College a little late. I was 24 when I came. And so I thought maybe a little differently, but I think it applies of when I wanted, uh, or when I went for placement, I wanted to go somewhere that I could see myself uh, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road. I wanted a place where I knew I could raise my family. And I went as a single person and now married with our first child. Um, I'm so thankful that I made the decision when I was 26, 27, getting placed, that I can go somewhere where my family could thrive. And it was not just a decision for me, but it was going to affect my, you know, my, my children and, and, and their children. And, you know, for me, to me, being planted um, and, and thriving is I just made a decision that, God, I'm going to go here. If you've called me and I have this conviction, I'm not leaving until you tell me that there's somewhere else to go. Um, I'm getting rooted. I'm, I'm, I'm building relationship. I'm building teams. I'm building people. Until you tell me that you are calling me somewhere else, I'm on this bus, and, and, I'm, I, and I want to be on the bus. You know? And I think that, to me, is the best way that you can do this is, is to really not look back and, and just say, God, you've called me here. And until you move me again, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to grow and to develop and, and to continue to you know, That's do what so you That's so good. And real to quick, do. too, you did student prac. Yep. But tell everybody what you've been doing since you've been at Heartland. So I haven't done students. Um, I haven't been over students one time um, in my time at Heartland. So, <laughs> so. Um, sorry to burst any bubbles in here. Um, but, you know, what really helped me was, was just saying, you know, I know that I'm called here, and it doesn't matter the position. Um, it doesn't matter the title. Um, and, and with that, it allows me to still be involved in students in some way. Um, I have the privilege of, of serving. We, we lead a student conference um, that we do in the spring, and I help lead in that way. Um, I'm on the board of uh, a summer camp that we partner with churches all across Texas and, and help with the summer camp. So I still get to be involved, but I just... I just let go of the desire for a title and just said, I'm just here to serve. And um, I've had to learn a lot of things because I'm in kind of in the production world um, when I first started and I knew nothing about production. So, (laughs) uh, but it's just been, I think just letting go of that desire of man, this is, I'm doing this lane. Um, You know, that, that doesn't always work out and that's okay. So being open to what God uh, has for you. Jessica, I uh, love your story. I'd love for you to talk 
about that same principle of being planted because you've been planted in Knoxville um, since you left HC. And uh, even talk a little bit about your church, how many campuses, and how God's brought you to your role now, but also where you started. Because I think it's important. It's not just how you start, but it's how you finish. And you're, you've uh, persevered through that whole time. Yeah. I went as an intern initially. Um, and so internship was supposed to last like how many, how, whatever it was back in the day, like a couple months, right? And so three months into the internship, um, our worship pastor at the time, she called me in and was like, hey, we have a position for you to stay if you want to, leading the, it's called development now, not infuse, right? Yep, <laughs> development process at Faith Promise, because I had just graduated, so I stepped into doing that. So intern to leading the infuse development. And then in 2020, two, not that long ago, um, we found out our senior pastors would be transitioning leadership over. And so our senior pastor um, was married to the worship pastor at the time, Michelle Stevens. And uh, she kind of called me in one day and I was just faithful. Um, and she was like, hey, we're about to transition. You're the person. And I was like, me? Like, honestly, like if you looked at the makeup of our team at the time and the talent, right? What the, what the world sees as talent. I was just like, what? And so um, when you said the planet and thriving thing, when you sent that, I got this revelation that the planet part is our job, so the natural. So in Matthew 25, when the, the guy entrusts those talents to the people and they multiply it, right? So the top two multiplied it, and then he said, hey, the one that didn't, hey, you wicked servant, right? And the other got the well done. So that's my job, to take the talents that he's entrusted with me in the natural. And then God does the thriving part. So that's the revelation I got. He will bring the blessing. He will bring the increase. Another story is the kid that just brought his lunch. It wasn't his lunch, but it was his fish and loaves um, to, to the miracle of Jesus multiplying the, the fish and the loaves, right? He brought his lunch. He did the natural part, and then God brings the thriving part. So when you sent that, I was just like, that's how I compartmentalized it. Like, our job is to do the planted part, what you're saying. I'm coming no matter what the title. Um, I'm here to serve. Worship is just a part of what I do now. Even I do some other stuff. And so the planet is in the natural is our part. And then God will bring the thriving and the supernatural blessing. Does that make sense? That's so good. That's so good. I hope you guys are taking notes and being inspired. Um, Tanner, I know you said 2014. Uh, what's crazy is a decade since you graduated. <laughs> As Kelly said earlier, a lot has changed. Uh, you, you, you survived the eclipse yesterday, right, coming in. I uh, would love for you to talk just for students. If a student's sitting here and they look up here and they're like, I want to make sure that 10 years after I graduate, I'm still in ministry, doing what God's called me to do. Um, what are some things practically that you would impart for them to have? Great question. And... Uh... Once it's been 10 years, you get called things like pioneer, legend, uh, <laughs> which makes it old. And I, and I told uh, respectfully President Mark Pettis over here, he's, I said, that makes me feel old. And if I feel old, I can't imagine how old he feels. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, having a sense of humor is one way to stay around somewhere. <laughs> um, but I think it's a paradox of, of longevity, you know, it's. Mm. You have to have an equal parts of soft heart, conviction, and humility before God, mm -hmm. and equal parts passion, pioneering, mm -hmm. driving, yeah. you know, focus in serving people. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for me, some of those things, because of those two men that I just, realized, or just mentioned, uh, was instilled into me. Also, my senior pastor, Pastor Joe Champion, is just amazing at that. He is the best at a funeral, and he's also the best at getting our church, you know, unified for a vision. Yeah. And, you know, I think longevity is really just about your perspective and your ability to uh, keep soft in your heart. Mm -hmm. It's a love for God. It's a passion. It's a conviction. It's confession of sin. It's having the people in your life that are close enough to you that don't think that you're all that in a bag of chips, you know. It's you have to stay soft. Yeah. But then the equal parts of I have to have a growth mindset of I'm building my leadership capacity, I'm building my professionalism, I'm building my, my ability to handle responsibility. Uh, and yeah, so I think really when it comes to longevity, you can have those two things in balance and have people around you that you can say, I am specifically identifying these people to help me in these two areas, then longevity is just the byproduct. 
being at Celebration for nine years wasn't just because it was like, you know, I can't wait to go somewhere and be there for nine years. Mm -hmm. It was, I just said yes, like everyone has said, and from then on out, it's just been yes after yes, so. That's so good. I actually asked a student, uh, what were some questions you'd want to ask alumni? And one, one of the themes that a lot of the students said was that transition period. So kind of going off the cuff here, anyone that wants to chime in, what, uh, when, when you think back to when you graduated and now you're transitioning from student to potential employer at a church and you're, you're, you're not a student anymore and now you actually have responsibility, what are some ways the students can prepare for that transition, uh, whether they're a fourth semester or even the freshmen that are here studying, getting ready for that? How would you all encourage them in that? I mean, I think... I think one thing is when you do ministry, you are committing to be a lifelong learner. There is never a moment where you stop learning um, and you stop growing and developing and, and, and really expanding your capacity like, like uh, Tanner was saying. That is a commitment that you make for the rest of your life uh, because um, if you're not growing, you're dying. Um, and you have to continue to say, the difference is, is you lose maybe the environment, you lose the classes, you, you lose all of these amazing things that Highland College provides, and, and you have to do it for yourself. And you have to say, you know, I, if I want to continue to, you know, handle the responsibility, handle what, what is being asked of me, then I've got to become an expert of this thing. I've got to learn this. I've got to continue to grow. The growing and the learning, it doesn't stop when you leave. It just continues. Read this. <laughs> like, let this tell you more about who you are than anybody. Like, I think, I think Pastor John's in here. The goat. I don't know. I saw him. But, man, the encouragement that he provided, like, through my journey and, like, all those people, you're, they're not there anymore. And so, again, not that they're replacing this, but to a degree, you're just in it all the time. And so, like, let this tell you who you are more than somebody else or um, the people that you had surrounding you reminding you all the time. And, like, you got to stay anchored. Yeah. yeah, so something really cool over the last nine years of I've actually got to hire five Highlands College students. Mm -hmm. And seeing them transition uh, was really interesting. Um, because they all come from different family backgrounds. Some were in Tuscaloosa, you know, some were Auburn and here, you know, in, in Birmingham. And, um, yeah, I think the two things that I've realized on the ones that have stayed is, number one, is they're really good at making friends. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the best things that I remember here at Highlands College is Pastor Chris saying, you need to read every book on how to make friends mm -hmm. and on how to just be someone that is likable. And um, that's a great advice. I highly encourage all that. But then the second thing is that they were growth and solution oriented. Mm -hmm. So they recognized their weaknesses and they put into place solutions. They asked people, they identified their weaknesses. They asked people that they knew could coach them. And then they received their feedback and changed. Yeah. The, worst, the, the worst feeling, right, is, as a leader is when you're talking to someone and you just know that it's hitting a brick wall. Mm -hmm. Uh, the best feeling is when you're talking to someone and you're coaching them and you're realizing that they understand the power of growth and solution-oriented leadership. So if you can love God, first of all, build great friendships, have a humble heart with solution-oriented leadership, then transitioning, it's not that it won't be hard, uh, but you'll find that it's a lot easier to plant yourself in the church that you go to. That's great. Uh, one last question. Uh, I would say, like, a challenge or an encouragement to a student. You, you all were in these seats. Well, you were in the seats at Greystone. In uh, Grants seats. Mill. <laughs> not these seats. Yeah. These I'm just going to say my first year, it was three classes would be going on at the same time at Grants Mill. So it was like in the center there was a class on the side in the, in the stadium seating. And it was just like who's going to talk over the other. You know, it's like people are cheering, people are praying. I don't remember anything I learned, but I, I know it was great. That's how we, we built the college out, out of that. That's how it started. I, yeah. Cody was telling us last night about Expedition, how we had tarps and two-by-fours oh, yeah. as tents. Yeah, I, yeah, they gave us some, yeah. Tent. I, 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 built my own, I built tarps. my own tent, okay? 
It did saw, not go well. I saw uh, Pastor Layton almost fight a first semester on my <laughs> first year of expedition, so I don't know where he is, but... Um. We can spend the next 20 minutes on the stories, but uh, yeah. uh, Abby, if you have one thing that you would just challenge or encourage a student, what would it be? Yeah. I think that if you're in Highlands College right now and you are not holding any responsibility that really matters to you, it's going to be really hard for you the next place you go. Because when you get placed and you end up at a church, okay. the responsibility is on you. And so I would just say the greatest encouragement is if you feel like right now is a season to kind of sit back and watch and observe is to engage. Like right. use this season and say, ask your leader, give me something that if it fails, it's on me. Like ask them to give that to you because God wants to use your life in an incredible way. But if you go to your next place feeling like a student still, it's going to be because you didn't have responsibility in this season. And so I would just say, ask God and your leaders for responsibility. Come on, y'all can clap for that. It's amazing. Well, we are ready. Come on, we're in that By Faith series. Are y'all ready for the four on five? Uh, I want to make sure you guys take notes, lean in, be inspired, shout them down. Um, it's going to be incredible. Each of them have picked a hero of faith, a biblical character that they're going to preach on. And so uh, make some noise as they go. They're going to have five minutes on the clock to go. So first up, Jessica Elston, everybody. All right, I got five minutes. He said shout, but don't. All right, I'm going to start with our theme verse of by faith that we've been in. Hebrews 12, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Now, I know this was intentional because I think y'all got the marathon coming up, right? Uh-huh. All right, I'm going to give you two pieces of advice with one item. Salt is the item. Pre-race and during the race, put salt in your water. Trust me. Y'all heard of element, right? Electrolytes. Let's go. Somebody's a granola person like me. Okay. And then post-race, you're going to run you a bath. You're going to put some Epsom salt in there. Y'all don't even know what that is, maybe. And you're going to soak your sore muscles. So there you go. That's your first tip for today. So the hero of faith that I want to focus on is our guy, Abel. Abel. And his origin story is in Genesis chapter 4. Adam and Eve have broken communion with God from eating the fruit, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and now they're out of the garden, and they start to have kids. Eve first births Cain, and then Abel. So we'll pick up in verse number two. It says that when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some, y'all say some, of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best, y'all say the best, of his firstborn lambs from his flock. And the Lord accepted Abel in his gift, but he did not accept Cain in his gift. They both had an assignment, right? Cain was to cultivate the ground. Abel was to be a shepherd. They both were obedient. At the time of the harvest, they both brought an offering, but the Lord accepted Abel's, and here's why. Let's slide back over to Hebrews, in the hall of faith. Come on, I thought I wouldn't have a table, so this is going way better than I envisioned it. Hebrews 11, verse 4, it was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. So Abel, by giving his, his first and his best, I want to encourage and ask you today, is your offering still costly? For him to offer... The living sacrifice was a costly thing, a costly sacrifice, right? So it was the quality of your offering. I know Sundays every seven days and students is every week again, I think. And we have groups and whatever practicum that you're in, is your offering still costly? Does it cost you something? And the second part is, is your motive with your offering still pure? It says that Abel's offering gave evidence that he was righteous and then God showed his approval of his gifts. His pure motives in offering the first and the best is what God accepted and rejected Cain's because he gave some of his crops, right? So is your quality still costly and pure in motives as you serve and sacrifice? After we read about all these heroes of the faith, here's a sobering verse in verse 13. It says, all these people died still believing what God had promised them. 
They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. So will you still bring a, a costly sacrifice and an offering, even if God doesn't bless it how you think he's going to? And I know it's easy to fake the quality of our offering. It's easy to hide. So only you and the Lord knows if you're bringing a costly covering, a costly offering week to week. And just like Kelly said in that moment earlier, this is for me. I can tell when I'm, I'm not bringing a costly sacrifice anymore or if my motives are impure, right? And so I want to encourage you and challenge you today to continue to bring an acceptable, pleasing offering to the Lord because he's worth it. Love you guys. I'm going to leave that time on the clock for Tanner. <laughs> I have two favorite people in the Bible. I only get to pick one today, but it's uh, Peter and David. And they have a trait about them that brings me a lot of comfort. It's a um, trait that's not exclusive to them because they're not the only ones, but it seems like they were the ones that were the most prone to it. That trait is making boneheaded mistakes. They are the absolute poster children of mess-ups. Some of the worst mistakes imaginable. And it encourages me because when I read some of those mistakes, when I see some of their decisions, it lets me know that if God could use those two men, then I know he can use me. God not only uses them, but scripture says David was a man after God's heart. And Peter was renamed Peter, which means rock. And God said, I will build my church on this rock. God loved them dearly, had great plans for them. And if it's true for them, then something tells me it's true for me and for you. But I want to leave you with this thought and just focus on David. We've all heard the stories of David, a hero of the faith. But this morning, I want to look at a part of David's story that I think gets overlooked. And it's when he's anointed to be the next king of Israel. See, 1 Samuel 16 is where we find this story, and starting in verse 11, it says, uh, it, it's right when we're going to pick up, right when Samuel has seen all the other sons. He's, he's asking Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? And Jesse responds, there is still the youngest, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goods. Now, they're, they're goats, there are uh, a, a, another sermon for another day. I only have five minutes, so... Um, I'm, I'm, he left him out in the field, though, and he, his own father didn't t- tell him to come. That's another sermon. But immediately, Samuel asks Jesse to send for him. And, and when David arrives, the Lord sees him and, and talks to Samuel and says, This is the one. Anoint him. And it's an incredible moment. And we don't know the exact age, but many believe that David is around 15 to 19 years old in this moment. It's a moment that will change the trajectory of his life forever. And the next verse, uh, as you read on the the passage, and I'm paraphrasing, but it talks about the moment and how it's done in, in front of his entire family. And it says that the spirit of the Lord is upon him from that day forward. And then there's a note at the end of the chapter, and it just says this. It just says, Samuel returned to Ramah. So this incredible moment happens, this this life-changing moment where David is called by God and, and nothing happens. Wait, Samuel just leaves? David doesn't go with him? He's been called to be the next king of Israel and we're just gonna go on the rest of our day like that's just normal? Why isn't he getting taken straight to the palace? You're telling me he's just going to go back to an insignificant field, watch the insignificant sheep when he has been just named king. And friends, I'm going to tell you that's exactly what happened. In fact, from the time David was anointed king to the time he became king was like 15 to 18 years between that moment and when he actually became king. And if we're not careful, we can miss this. We could say to ourselves, that's so insignificant. That job is so small. That responsibility has no impact. But I believe God sees it differently. That was time for God to do something significant in David's life. So that when David sat where God had called him to, he would be ready. 
And it speaks to me so much because there have been so many times in my life where I've been given a responsibility or put into a position that felt so small it felt so pointless but looking back what I realized was that I needed to be refined I needed to go through a process I needed to be able to take one talent and multiply it to two and then multiply it to five because if I was given the calling from the jump I might have buried it in the ground because I wasn't ready David shows me the importance of not taking small beginnings lightly It was in that time that after David was anointed as the next king that he went back to the field protecting the sheep with no one else around. And he killed the lion and the bear in preparation to kill the giant. It was in that moment that God was preparing for David for what was his next. So we have a choice. We can scoff at the process or we can learn from David. And in the moments of being responsible of watching the sheep, of doing the small role, the question is, is will you do it faithfully with no one looking around? Will you trust God in the process of refinement and do it in his name with no recognition? Don't despise small beginnings. That's great. They made it really hard on us preachers now to give us five minutes. Um, But I feel like God has a very specific word for a couple people in this room. And so I'm just going to read my notes today because I really, uh, I feel like God has, has a word for you. But since the beginning of time, God has been drawing close to us in his creation of humanity and his walking in the garden in his relationship with the people of Israel and his temple dwelling In his extravagant love sending Jesus, in his giving us the Holy Spirit, he has, he always has and always will be drawing close to us. But my question to you today is, are you drawing close to Jesus? The disciple John is an example of what it means to draw close to Jesus. We see John in three unique places in scripture that reveal his desire to draw close. The first is that John is the only disciple at the cross. The second is that John is the first disciple that ran to the tomb. And then John is listening closely to Jesus and Peter's redemptive conversation. You can read that in the Gospel of John. Also in the Gospel of John, we have the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. We see the longest recorded conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus. John describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is a flex. The only gospel, it's the only gospel that has the I am statements in it. And so what does this show you is that John was determined to be close to Jesus. I have many men and women in my life, many sitting in this room, who when I look at their life, I see a closeness and a hunger for Jesus that my heart desires. But no one can be close to Jesus for me. No one can cultivate a relationship with God, a drawing near except for me. And I'm afraid to say that I see many in this generation, specifically those who aspire to be in ministry and myself at times, who become okay with taking from someone else's relationship with Jesus and using it to get through difficult seasons. But we must be a generation who digs deep and is desperate to be close to Jesus at the core of who we are. At the crucifixion, we see both John and Peter as teachers to us of what it means to draw close. We know that John is the only disciple at the cross. He's joined by Mary, the mother of Jesus, and some other very brave women. However, we see Peter in Matthew 26 in what scripture says, following at a distance. We see in the same passage Peter denying Jesus in Jesus' most painful moments. One is is standing for Jesus and one is denying Jesus. And what's the difference? John is drawing close while Peter is at a distance. You have a choice to make. You can draw close or you can follow at a distance. You can stand for Jesus in your generation or you can deny him when it gets hard. And so what happens when we draw close? In John 19, it says, But standing at the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. So why did John get the great assignment of caring for the woman who Jesus loved, his mother? because he was the only one standing there. John must have been shocked. He got to carry, care for Mary in place of Jesus. He was trusted with that. I think many of giants of the faith probably found themselves doing things for God they never dreamed, absolutely shocked. 
But I bet they also looked around and saw they were the only one still following Jesus. God trusts those who draw near, and those who draw near stand for Jesus. We have to be in this for the long haul. That will mean intense sacrifice. That will mean hard conversations about sin with people. That will mean losing friends. That will mean fighting in prayer for my generation. That will mean protecting my kids' minds and hearts. That will mean submission to God's word. I've seen in my life that when I am running after Jesus, drawing close to him, desperate for him, that I am willing to stand for Jesus in the face of culture, pressure, doubt, and fear. In moments where culture could intimidate me, I'm not afraid to stand for Jesus. I have friends who sat in Highlands College chapels with me who once dreamed of how God would use their life, now denying Jesus because they started following him at a distance. Distance made their heart weak for the ways of God. They could stand up for Jesus. They couldn't stand up for Jesus in moments when it mattered. Drawing close is rare. Only some will take time and have desire to pursue Jesus like others aren't willing to do. Highlands College, in your time here, if there is one thing you need to be desperately doing, it is drawing close to Jesus. When your friends are at a distance, draw close. When culture puts fear in your heart, draw close. When you don't know where God is calling you, draw close. When you need fresh anointing, draw close. When you need words for your heartbreak, draw close. When you need renewed purpose, draw close. Draw close to Jesus and see how he trusts you with more. Jesus, we are desperate for you and we draw close to you. Amen. It's not fair <laughs> to make me go after my wife. Wow. That was beautiful and very rich. Thank you, Abby. Uh, I want to start with a statement and a question. The statement is, how you think is how you live. And so then my second, my question for you is, when you think about the future, what do you think about? Because you can really see two things. You can see a, a mirror into the future of your will. Or you can look into the f future and see a window into God's will yeah. for your generation. You know, our generation is in dire need of leaders, of worship pastors, of, of events and designers who are in the latter. Who can look at the future and not see a mirror of the culture or a mirror of themselves, but can see a window into the kingdom of God and what he is wanting to do. In all four Gospels, we see a contrast of this. And it's this, these two characters. It's Pontius Pilate and it's Jesus. And what we see is we see Pontius Pilate being the one that led Jesus to the crucifixion and Jesus being the one who humbly and willingly accepts his fate going to the cross. Both saw the same situation, but Pilate saw the future as a mirror of himself and Jesus saw it as a window into the kingdom of God. So when you look at the future, what do you think about? There's really two things that expose the response in our heart. And the first is the culture. The culture being the primary way of thinking in our day and age, the common worldview that we all have. And then the second is the crowd. And the crowd are the people that assert the culture, the influences and the artists and the thinkers. And so if you have a mirror in front of you looking at your own will in the future, what happens with the culture is you become defined by your modern circumstance. And cultural relevance will cause you to bow to whatever is needed as long as you can get ahead. And a mirror with the crowd means that you will be defined by your insecurity and the feelings of others. And your ability to succeed or not will be in the hands of people which ultimately will make them the enemy. But if we have a future as a window into the kingdom of God, our culture becomes something that we understand and it becomes an opportunity for us to make true gospel impact and true kingdom chains. It also allows us to stand strong in the midst of whatever culture we may face. And then if you look at it through the window, the crowd, the people no longer become what dictates your identity or speaks to your security but they become people to serve and love, no matter, even if they lead to your persecution. So I want to give you two things that I want to leave you with today on how you can view the future like Jesus. Number one is you need to understand scripture. 
because of Pilate's misunderstanding of Scripture, he led Jesus to the crucifixion. He didn't understand what was happening, and he didn't understand his part to play in the fulfillment of the will of God. But Jesus, because of his understanding of Scripture, knew that he was not being led to crucifixion, but to resurrection. And your ability to have a command and a mind full of Scripture will 100% dictate your worldview. And it will 100% dictate your perspective when things get hard and culture changes and pandemics happen and crisis happen in the world. We have to allow our worldview to be defined by a command of Scripture. And then secondly is humility. Pontius Pilate allowed his insecurity to get the best of him. He was in tension because he thought that Jesus was innocent, but he knew what would happen if he said so. And he allowed his insecurity to make him bow to the crowd. He tried to shift responsibility, but Jesus, in humility, he wasn't fearful or defined by the crowd, but he saw the people that were trying to kill him, and he saw that they were the ones that he was going to suffer for. So I start out by asking you, what do you think about the future? I want to tell you what our future is if you need a perspective change today. Revelation 21, it says this. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He said, Write these things down, for they are faithful. And then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. So can you see it? Can you see a future of hope and expectation, a future where the joy and the love and the salvation of Christ goes beyond the crowd and the culture? Because our future as the church is Jesus. So let's be a generation that leads we under, with understanding of scripture, we're leading with humility, no matter what the culture or the crowd brings. Let's not look into the mirror, but let's look through the window of the gospel and lead our generation so that they can see Jesus for themselves. Can we, can we all stand to our feet? I wanna pray. Come on, why don't you just open your hands up before God, and I want to pray for you on behalf of all those who are up here with me today. God, I just pray right now that the Holy Spirit of God will come and rest on every one of these students. Lord, that the spirit of wisdom will meet them right now. God, that there would be a supernatural love for your word that would flood their mind and their hearts, that there would be a supernatural passion for the ways of God, for the house of God. For the word of God, Lord, we ask you right now for your love, for the people, for the crowds, for the one that's in front of us and the one that we haven't met yet. God, I pray that in whatever culture that we have in front of us, Lord, God, that you will give each one of these students the ability to see what you're doing in the midst of it. God, I pray like we've talked about in all of these sermons, Lord, that there would be a a spirit of faithfulness, a spirit of faithfulness, God, a spirit of drawing close to you, a spirit of bringing you sacrifice, a spirit of saying yes, no matter what the process is. God, we pray right now that the Holy Spirit would come, give dreams and visions, fill every student in here with a fresh love and passion for Jesus today. Thank you, God. You didn't need us, but you've chosen us for such a time as this. In Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Come on. I don't know about you, but do you feel like you're full of faith after that chapel? And encouraged and inspired. One more time for our awesome alumni, family. You know, uh, I want you guys to take, uh, take away this, is that when you're in moments like this in chapel, sports, half marathon, classes, or you're hanging out on the campus green, the, God, the, the, the people God's put around you are not there by accident. And 
I'm encouraged and full of faith seeing what God has done through my friends that one day we were just hanging out at Highlands College and God gave us dreams of what he called us to do. And I believe those same dreams that God gave us, God is speaking to you and giving you those dreams. And if you don't have it yet, it's coming. And so uh, what's great about this is this is not the end. It's alumni day. So some of you are gonna have classes uh, after lunch with some of these amazing leaders. And there's a whole nother crowd back there too. Let's honor them that are coming and teaching. So fun. Okay, I got two quick announcements. And one is the Torch Awards. How many of y'all excited about that? This is gonna be great. April 29th at 6, 30 p.m. I think we have a QR code. Um, oh yeah, wow, look at that graphic. Fancy. Yeah, you definitely wanna make sure you're dressed to the nines for that. That's how you RSVP. Don't forget to do that. Go ahead and get a quick picture of that. Uh, the deadline to register is April 17th, okay? So real important to make sure you register. The last announcement is student council, okay, for the first time ever at Highlands College. So starting next week, the student council nominees will begin campaigning, okay? Wyatt Miller already told me he's going to make a stop at every ministry lab on his campaign trail, all right? So he's excited about that. You got to be on the lookout. Shout out to Delaney as well. Okay, and uh, it's gonna be great. Election day, this is the election day that really matters, is Monday, April 22nd, all right? So uh, make sure you don't forget that. It's gonna be a great day, you guys. Let me pray real quick and we'll close it out, chapel. God, thank you so much for this amazing day. All these alumni that are here pouring into us. God, I thank you so much for our students. God, I pray that you will strengthen their leg muscles through this half marathon and please hydrate them this week in Jesus' name. Amen, you guys are dismissed.